Marlon's here today, and he knows I'm very fond of him, so he won't be offended if I say he's a very eccentric character. He's one of the most amazing people I know. He's got a rather wild imagination from someone who's trained as a historian. I'm always amazed at the leaps he can make and the connections he can make. He's a great storyteller, so I know you're going to enjoy the talk today. But he's actually had a rather interesting and colorful past, including being a zookeeper. Uh, but he's actually a professional archaeologist, historian, and architectural historian. Uh, he serves as a consultant on many historic structures in Iowa. I've tromped around the Young Family Barn and Farmstead up near North Liberty with him. I've gone around a Civil War training camp down in Mount Pleasant. I've walked through barns with him. The way that he can read the architecture and read the evidence, even the Hayek house over here on Dodge, where he could recognize the characteristics that that was a milk paint in use, or looking at the Weatherby Cottage, he could see the saw blade, the way it had cut the wood, which helped him date that siding to the 1850s. So his ability to read the physical environment, where the outhouse was, what the wood was, is equivalent to someone else possibly reading a book. So my hat is off to him for doing that. He also wrote a major treatise on the history of early roads and highways in Iowa. He's an expert on Dillon's Furrow, for example, but also all the highway construction that went on in Iowa up through the 1940s. He earned a, a Bachelor of Science degree in anthropology and did graduate work in archaeology at the Illinois State University at Normal. He sometimes authors uh, articles in the Little Village. Today he's going to talk about brewery cave investigations that started here in Iowa City and have continued up in Cedar Rapids. I was lucky enough to go down in one of those caves, and so I know you're going to really be thrilled by the stories that he tells you today of what's hidden underground, the things we walk by every day that we don't take any notice to. So please join me in welcoming Marlon. Well, what a nice crowd, and it's a pleasure to see everybody here. And I am going to do a little bit of history and technology at the same time with this presentation. Some of it's going to sound pretty technical, but I'm not going into the details. I'm just going to see and show you how technology applies to history and how it applies to archaeology and geology and, and <coughs> the environment. And that the state of equipment and the uh, science available has really come a long ways. And um, it didn't start that way. I started off originally uh, in a project in 1998 in Dubuque where um, a uh, beer cave was impacted by highway construction and I managed to talk my way into every brewery cave and brewery that was extant in Dubuque and a few others. And so I kind of got my start that way on it. And then um, when I was working in Brewery Square, I knew the caves were down there, and so um, I started to get acquainted with them. And so this is kind of an overview of the Union Breweries, the Iowa City Beer Caves for the first part here, and um, looking at the caves themselves, but also at the remote sensing possibilities for finding the lost caves and other underground features that are uh, right next to them. Now, this is not my best start, but I like the way history works. Somebody in Cedar Rapids was canoeing down the river in 1979 and found this bottle on a sandbar. And it's from the uh, Magnus Brewing Company in Cedar Rapids. And the, uh, um, the beer cave had been hit by highway construction. And a lot of the bottles had like oh, been liberated, you might say. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> this one happened to wash up. And I just think that, and they wrote about, uh, in the sidebar there, about the ancient beer cave or caverns that were discovered and had been lost down there. And I think just a little bottle like that sometimes can make the difference in uh, whether history is uh, personal or, or just dry, all right? And that really added a lot to my perspective of the whole thing. And what the part of town I'm dealing with here in Iowa City is uh, Clinton and Market Street. Now, here is the uh, 1869 uh, bird's eye view. And the breweries, there's the Catholic Church. It's still um, extant there. And here is the Union Brewery, the Englert Brewery, and the Great Western Brewery. So there was three breweries uh, very close together out there right there. Um, they're large buildings for the time. They were some of the biggest buildings uh, in town, and the Great Western was the biggest brewery in Iowa. Now, the brewery caves are made uh, in a cut and cover kind of manner, where they dig a big hole, they start in the bedrock and cut that out and use the rock to make 
the brewery caves, or they bring in bricks and they build the caves and then they build the buildings on top of them. And these are uh, factories. These are beer factories and they are run by the gravity method. Um, various processes, the cooking and the, the malting and uh, the wort are made up in the upper stories and as it progresses down by gravity it gets down eventually through piping into the uh, beer caves itself which are always uh, 55 degrees so it's pretty ideal for beer at 55 degrees and then they let them age in the caves or they call them aging caves and then they put them in kegs and we're going to see some of the aging caves that have survived. Most of these breweries, two of the big breweries in town, were demolished through urban renewal, but the Union Brewery has uh, survived pretty well intact, except for a major fire in 1927, but I'll get to that later. Um, this is an 1879 view of the area. There's the Catholic Church. The brewery is up there in the corner, and, and there's all kinds of buildings and houses and grocery stores and dwellings and markets and and a really different kind of environment around that whole block and area that you really wouldn't recognize today if you're gonna go back there. Now, the, the brewmaster's house still stands, but there were like four other houses in that same lot. And there's that big open space here with ice houses and wagon sheds and uh, cooper shops. And all these things are going on there all the time. And it would have smelled like beer. And you would have, you would have heard chopped wood. And you would have seen horses stuck in the mud. And, you would have, it, and in the wintertime, I'm sure it was a very miserable existence. So one of the things that, in order to get away from that, um, is they put a tunnel uh, underneath the road there on uh, Market Street to get to the old hotel where their tavern was. So there was tunnels that in that area did go under the street. When I was uh, just looking at this a little closer, I would say, you can see these other businesses here. But as I looked at this Sanborn um, insurance map, I could see a thing up there that said ELE. All right, and I knew where the entrance to the caves were in Brewery Square. And I go, okay, that's the big freight elevator. There used to be like a steam run or maybe horse drawn run um, elevator there to begin with. And in the fire in 1927, um, it burned up. And now there's just a big long shaft that goes down into the ground. Here next to the Union Brewery, this is the Dostal Great Western Brewery, and it burned down in 1909, uh, kind of suspiciously, considering the fire station was right across the street. And uh, <laughs> in, instead of, and it stood for quite a while, but then they decided just to push it all down into the ground. So that old whole building is now the parking lot there between the Bluebird and George's. And they lose an SUV in there once in a while, and cars will sink a bit, and elements collapse, and you know they just keep working at it. So the only way to get down in the beer caves is to go down the old elevator shaft, which there's no elevator anymore. And it's a bit of a drop. And so uh, whenever I have crowds of people, um, I set up rigging and have people come in to make sure that safety, safety, safety when it comes to getting down this thing. And you, there's things about you can't weigh over 250 pounds, you can't be afraid of heights, the dark, confined spaces, you can't have any disabilities, you know. There, it, it's a place that if something went wrong, you'd be in big trouble. Now I'm gonna see if I can get this one to play, because you, you never get to see what it's like to walk up to the edge. And this is the, I'm, everybody else is always making movies of this thing, but, this is one of the head that says, okay, this is how you go down. All right, so that's it. And usually it's just one ladder, okay? The old ladder didn't even reach to the top. So you'd have to hang over the edge and then uh, continue on down. So, and, you know, this is like climbing down the edge, there's ropes, there's ladders, there's somebody down there that's watching every step that you take, I do. It's like stand up straight, put your foot, you got four steps, three steps, two steps, make sure everybody gets down. So now we're going down the shaft and you can see other older tunnels off here to the side and back there on the wall is the tunnel that's been filled in that used to go under uh, uh, Market Street to the old hotel across the way. Now both of these, the hotel and this, they were built 
were finished in about 1855. And so, the, you know, these are grand old buildings in town, and the people that owned, built, and operated these buildings were some of the wealthiest people in town and in the state. Now, a lot of people want to hear about the 1884 beer riots. Well, I'm not talking about that. They want to hear about the owners. They want to do this and that. This is about the caves themselves, how they were discovered, how they operated, and technology that can be used to uh, delineate where the lost ones are or what other elements are going on. So there's Mary herself. When you go down the ladders, there's a big pile of rubble, and then there's doors that go off to either side, which go into the beer caves. Um, they are of different sizes. One's kind of curved, and it's about 113 feet long, and the other one's probably about 60 or 70 feet long. And they're constructed the old Roman method over there on the left, where you built a uh, wooden framing underneath of it, and you take the really skin, skinny slabs of rock, put that over the top of the arch, then fill in the stuff on top of it, and then build the rest of your building. Now, this is a diagram of a, a, the beer cave I had done in Dubuque, and it shows it um, divided into sections. There were doorways, air shafts, there were like false openings in case they wanted to expand the caves, and um, this one had been abandoned and part of it was caving in, and a lot of these are just lost in the sense that uh, the people who own the property often know that they're out there, but they're inherently dangerous places to be, and so they, it's like a well in your yard or something. You just try to keep everybody away from it so you don't have any problems. When I first would go down there, it was like the Titanic down to the ocean. It was just more about um, uh, dark and dank and thinking about getting back up. And eventually, we started getting some lights in there. Now, the inside of this one is made out of brick. Um, and it, there's probably a couple million bricks in the construction of this thing. And they're all made nearby here in town. Um, this is one of the old um, aging rooms. And during the fire, all the eight foot tall containers, the wooden staved barrels, um, burned down. And this is just the hoops that held them together. On the walls here are niches where they would put torches to see inside of there. Now, in 1855, you didn't have kerosene. So you either had whale oil or you had candle, candle wax of some form, or you had some kind of rush uh, torch or maybe a, a fat Betty lamp. We're burning like fat with a little strip of cloth coming out of it. And there's also um, things from the gravity system coming from upstairs, venting down through the ceilings. So this was a, a major operation in a factory down there. And uh, I had a reporter one time ask me, why did people work down there in the dark all the time? And I said, well, free beer. OK? <laughs> you know, it wasn't like it was like a mystery. <laughs> and uh, um, this is my friend, uh, Dr. Deborah Suda, Sudra, who uh, unfortunately passed away here this last year. But when the, uh, the breweries uh, closed down in Prohibition, they went to bottling um, soda, soda pop, mostly. And so this is a early remnant of a cooling system to be able to um, cool down the sodas and mix the sugars and, and get things ready to be bottled. The bottling plant was somewhere else. And you can see the door in the back, which leads down to the elevator shaft. And inside that, there's a little niche there that's an office about this big, where there's a little shelf or a candle, a piece of paper, and probably a stein right there on the top of it, because I know that that's all they did down there pretty much was drink beer. That was the point. So this is um, looking in, a, in the second tunnel, and it is, um, or looking back towards the elevator shaft from the second tunnel, which is curves around. And you can see all the strapping here that held the pipes and held uh, the uh, large staved barrels. And there's a, a trough in the floor that they used to run a spring out of the end wall of it, and they would not lift the barrels, they would float them along to the elevator. When they got to the elevator, they'd put them on the elevator and they'd take them up. And there's higher late cave levels, there's actually like three or four levels of them, but they're smaller and they're closer to the surface and they weren't for aging, they were for storage mostly and distribution. So, I mean, that's the intro to 
inside of the beer caves, what they looked like. They're about 33 feet deep down in the ground. Um, access to them is down a 23 foot ladder and um, not everybody likes to go down the ladder. Many people have walked up, no way, okay? So I wouldn't go down there for anything. And I was like, well, I'll go, just step back and <laughs> So here again, I'm just like showing you the old plan of the brewery as it was in 1879. So now we're going up to about like uh, uh, 2010. We're gonna do an electromagnetic inductive technique where um, this instrument looks like a giant potato cannon, but it isn't. It's very expensive, very sensitive. And what it does, it sits at, sends out electromagnetic pulse. And the pulse reads at uh, 9 feet and 18 feet. And what it does, essentially, I'm simplifying this quite a bit, is it makes all the iron stand up. And then it measures the iron in there. And so what you're looking at is either high iron or low iron. All right. So here we did a survey around the brewery. This is the brewery and this is the print shop that was added onto it. Now we're going along the edge and you can see super high iron, which is you would expect next to the main road there with all the piping and the construction and the lost elements, the debris. But in the back, you can see cool spots, like right in here where there is, isn't anything back there, which tends to lead one to believe that there's some kinds of vacuities down there, or just low iron readings. This isn't a three-dimensional picture. This is to, uh, gives you an idea of the amount of, down there, the bluer, uh, no iron, the redder on this one is high iron. And you can see in areas right here where one of the tunnels come out that you have, lots of iron surrounding a blue spot. And that's where the end of that 113 foot tunnel comes out in the parking lot, underneath the parking lot of ways. This is nearby where another brewery, part of the Great Western Brewery stood. And uh, I knew that there was uh, elements of this lot that was caving in. Every time I'd walk by there, part of it was caving in here and there. So in the middle of winter, we did a, just a quick up and down survey and then found this really amazing anomaly out in the middle of the parking lot there. And I did some research and I found out that there used to be an 80 foot deep by 10 foot wide well out there for the bottling plant. And over where the little circle is, there is a series of houses right there. So we're looking essentially 18 feet down in the ground at a big empty space. Things full of water don't have hardly any iron in them and so they turn blue and you get variations within there and something like the circular element in the corner is a cistern or another well or a, some kind of other excavation that uh, was probably associated with the house that stood there. Um, so I had been to the Dubuque Caves, I had really uh, checked out the Iowa City breweries and, and then one day at the State Archaeologist Office, Mike Perry and myself got a call from the Department of Transportation saying that they had found a sinkhole underneath I-380 in Cedar Rapids. And uh, they wanted somebody to tell them what it was. And so they called me and they thought it was a brewery. They looked at some maps and it seemed uh, to relate very strongly with the uh, Magnus's uh, Eagle Brewery up there in Cedar Rapids. So um, showed up on site and this is pretty much what we saw. Cedar Rapids had had like almost a 12 inch rain um, a few weeks before and the bridge crew was out examining the bridges of that part of uh, the 380 interchange there through town and found this hole down here. It doesn't look like much, you know, it looks like uh, just a hole in the ground, it, but it turned out that it's much deeper than anybody expected. And uh, we, uh, the bridge uh, crew had an infrared camera and they put it down in there and they dropped a line down in there and Mark Carter, who was head of the District 6 uh, bridge crew for the Department of Transportation, actually was like an ex spelunker and he decided he was gonna go down in there. And so he did. And, <laughs> and uh, it's one of those kind of places that um, um, kind of surreal in a way. So, I mean, 
uh, we, on the surface, I examined the uh, telephoto and the infrared live action camera that was stuck down in there. I, could, I understood how it was constructed. I could see these giant I-beams from the overpass uh, kind of pin cushioning it through there. And I realized that it's ugly and it's misty, but it's probably safe. It's the sinkhole that I didn't trust. It wasn't worried about the cavern itself, it was the getting down and out. And so basically I got a, got a rope and an oxygen sensor and my courage up and dropped down a 10 foot hole on a ladder, crawled into the cave and then they pulled the ladder out so they could put some lights down there so I could see. So there was a couple of minutes down there, I was in like, you know, pitch black, thinking I can't even see daylight at the back of this hole. And, uh, but I finally, I, Worked it out, got my camera going, and I, uh, there's more photos than this, and, but it's just showing how it's constructed, like that um, arch, the Roman arch, where they're putting the blocks of stone, and the, the, at some time, the city of Cedar Rapids had tried to fill them up with rubble and weren't very successful with it. They didn't get it all the way to the top, but uh, we, I was able to tell, like I could see about 30 feet in one direction, and, about 30 feet in the other direction, and I definitely knew it was Brewery Cave. And so that set off a series of uh, investigations in terms of what actually is down there, what does it mean? And what had happened was that um, there was two breweries in that location in the 1850s, and they uh, were, one of them was rebuilt in the 1870s, very large, the Magnus Brewery on the left and Williams on the right, which between them were estimated to have between eight and maybe 11 um, caverns down there to, to store their beer. Well, in 1939, um, the city tore all that down and the caves just stood open for a little while and became an attractive nuisance and then they filled them in, they walled them over and, and then um, all that was, uh, there's Christian Magnus himself, he's a very upright man who became very wealthy and owned several hotels in Cedar Rapids and lots of property and was a real player politically and otherwise in state and local government and beyond. So, um, you know, this is a pretty impressive building with the cupola up on top of it and the giant eagle that he had imported and, and it's all made out of solid uh, Anamosa limestone which they carted down. And if you look at the left side, you can see where it's banked into the hill slope. Well, that's where the uh, brewery caves ex exited, exited the building and went underneath where the highway eventually was constructed. Now, the DOT had done in, in the 1969 corings all over the place. And they sent me the plans for the road construction. And on, on this page, you can see where they hit all these voids. And it's clearly they're hitting the beer tunnels. Some of them are collapsed, some of them are filled in. One of them's like nearly 100 feet long. These, this, you'd have to read the scale on this, but, um, and then the vertical shafts are where the uh, corings went through. This was a little hard to see, but uh, uh, the uh, DOT geologists took those um, coring plots from the maps and uh, georeferenced them to what investigations I had in the current and did this three-dimensional map of where these cores are. And I, this is um, interesting just since it's all by elevation and three dimensions and that you can do georeferencing to take an old landform and turn it into a three-dimensional map like this, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite telling in terms of how well those core holes are potentially going to match up to what it was that we're looking for down there. Now, this is a picture of the construction of 380 in Cedar Rapids in about, oh, uh, 1971, I believe. And, and what you can see here is a big hole, the bridge that stayed like that for about 10 years. And the breweries are over here. This is Cargill um, there. And the uh, sinkhole was right here next to those tanks. So the breweries were here. Uh, the caves came out. They ran into some in the construction of this. They uh, had let the construction lag for about 10 years. and then. Started, they'd go ahead and build it because they were just going to punch those steel beams through the caves anyway. Here is an aerial photograph showing the, how it was constructed with the big loop. There were the 
dots are in the upper left. Next to that was where the sinkhole was. This is the property lines and the individual lots back um, when the city was first laid out in that area. And so we're kind of zoning in here on this circular area, area there in the center. We know where the caves were, in, you know, historically. I'd been in one, I knew it existed. And then we decided uh, as a first step to do ground penetrating radar investigation, which would tell us whether there was potentially other caves there or not. So we're underneath the bridge there and we're cleaning off the soil. We're setting up the ground penetrating radar. We're laying out some transects. Uh, this is Glenn Story, he's calibrating the equipment. And the ground penetrating radar is like a, almost like a lawnmower it looks like, but it isn't. And you move it along in a straight line, it sends out radar pulses, which you, reads back to it. And then you get some very interesting um, maps. Here's uh, uh, Mark Carter, the first guy down in the cave ever, and Mike Perry, an archeologist I work with. We worked together on this project, the equipment. So this is some of the first stage of the surface looking down on where we thought the beer caves were. And this is, the one on the left is showing the beer cave that I entered, and the two on the right are um, but probable caves that were discovered through the ground penetrating radar uh, search. So this is what it looks like, but what it's, this is showing you from the side is that the columns, the vertical elements that are striped are probably structural walls. The cross elements, like the arrows pointing to, tells you that it's a void because it echoes back and forth in two directions at the same time. So it crosses, they cross each other. And uh, if it was solid, more solid there, you'd get a more direct reading. And so this uh, reverse polarity, uh, where it's pointing to in the center right there, is the cave. And the stripes on the side are the walls of the cave. You have to be able to understand what these mean and, and you know, uh, be able to uh, uh, print out one of these great maps. But it was a really great clue in proving that uh, those caves were there and they existed. Now this is a, a really a three-dimensional view looking down and it's showing in the center of this the big groove full of lumpy stuff which is a beer cavern that has been um, buried down there. And it's showing it in feet and various dimensions across. So we were able to, through geo-referencing, take those uh, GPS locations and then locate their exact locations in the modern day and on top of the uh, uh, 1870 plat map or, or San, Sanborn Insurance Atlas and we could match it up. This is the brewery there and then this is the back of it and you can see where the caves are coming out of the back of the brewery there, the, Eag the Eagle Brewery, Magnus, and um, it's telling us that as a, as a first method, this is, this is where they are, and there's likelihood of others, but we had been able to track those particular ones. The next step was uh, a resistivity testing, where you use a series of pins and electrodes stuck into the ground. So and as a test run, and it was kind of a cold winter day, um, we're setting up underneath the bridge on the area that we had covered with the ground penetrating radar to, to do a test run to see how well this was going to work in the circumstances that we were um, hoping that it would correlate very well with all the previous historic and, and uh, ground penetrating radar results. And, you know, they could calibrate their instrumentation to find the caves because we know pretty much where they were. So this is what's going on with this, this testing. And what it, it looks like just the worst case of extension cords you can imagine in the world. And what you see is the loops there. And at the end of each loop is a pin stuck down into the ground. And that's sending a current down into the ground um, that's pretty darn strong, but there's hundreds of them, and they're all lined up and connected like this. And so um, when we moved on to the field part in that big loop in the middle where the highway exit is, you can see all the cordage running on, on each line, about 250 feet. And there was 10 lines that were done 
of about 250 feet. So this is a large area that we're covering, and the caves are at an unknown depth, and whether they all survived or not, uh, not exactly sure. So this is how the transects, we knew where the brewery was, we set up the transect points and then cross points, and each one of those dots is where a reading was taken, all right? And we did some between the roads, hoping that we could it was uh, not so disturbed that we wouldn't be able to see something um, through those areas too. And so this is how it came out, all right? We're looking at lines two and line six and line seven on that kind of uh, uh, transect grid there. And so when it's reading out down here to over 20 feet, excuse me, as you can see the, uh, the acuities there, you can, you can see where the, uh, um, the caves are, and you can also see on the left of the top one there where there's something else going on, probably part of the bridge abutment that was built there, and you can see that there's smaller things up above, but those are probably more related uh, to construction or fill elements for uh, surface drainage or sewage or, or something of that type. As we, we go along each line, things appear and disappear, but you can still see the hot, the hot spots and the low spots. In some places, new elements show up that nobody had really thought were out in that particular part of the, uh, of the test area. So then we also, remember when we were doing the brewery in Iowa City, the long um, testing instrument going across, reading the iron on the surface, and doing electromagnetic pulses down about nine and 18 feet, and then reading what comes back. And the first one over there is like uh, just short of 10 feet. This one's at 20 feet, and you get different elements. And so what, is, what it's showing is hot spots where there should be uh, uh, vacuities located next to it. And you see really empty spots, which are probably uh, brewery uh, caves that we really didn't expect. Now, um, these were preliminary stuff, but they're, <coughs> excuse me, um, really showing that um, there are more um, uh, beer caverns out there than had been uh, suspected. The historical information had really said that there was anywhere from like eight to 11 or six. Nobody was really sure if they're counting continuous caves or caves were divided up into different sections, like the real ones that we uh, it looked at earlier underground where there's doorways connecting tunnels and really what they thought was a cave or not. The uh, black strip through there is a, uh, is a uh, drainage tile that goes to a sewer or uh, wastewater sewer, I guess I would, or outlet. And so, you know, that was all very disturbed and we really, could, you know, didn't even try to get a lot of data out of that. As we got further into the modeling, it becomes uh, really, really busy down there. And we get all the ver these various elements of high iron. We get strong uh, vacuity showing up. And it's a little bit like looking at your blood vessels or something. Over on the far left side on line one and in one three there, there's a really strange anomaly going on there next, next to a, uh, which might be another cave that was under an embankment. And the, uh, up there, and you can see if you can, one four or so, it's just showing like the three feet of height of the cave that I was in. And then it's showing um, um, a more uh, um, round um, profile of it there in that one one. And then over here, and it's like, what other very large thing is going going on, that was somewhat unexpected. Here at the bottom in line two, you can see a different development of uh, the vacuities, especially that one, two, one. It's clearly there is um, an underground cavern or, or a void down there. And then these other two are really pretty well matching up with the ones we had found originally in the, uh, with the ground penetrating radar. So um, in a, in a, in a way, we are able to like peer down and look into the ground and see what 
has been lost and now rediscovered. We can, we can see all the various elements of construction, the natural um, um, original um, horizons of the stratification of the soils and the rock. We can um, make some planning judgments through this about uh, is the highway good? Yes, it is. It's all solid. Um, how are we going to deal with these? Are we going to preserve them? Are we going to uh, fill them in with mortar or grout or something on that order? Um, are there other ones out there to, to investigate? Clearly, in some areas that won't be impacted really by uh, the highway or any uh, construction on that order, you will, um, there's other things to be discovered. Now, if I took this over next to the parking lots here in town, I did the same thing in those parking lots. We could read where all the foundations were. We could do it in various levels every 10 feet, or we could do it like from top to bottom, you know, like 30 feet down. We could see how much iron is in there. We could see where the machinery was. And I see this as a positive attribute for uh, planning and uh, building construction and development because uh, those lots have not been built upon for the simple reason that nobody knows what's exactly down there and they don't really want to get into it. And the city owns the big parking lot and the other one uh, where the Englert Brewery was is um, um, privately owned. So again, we're, we're marching along line five, line six, line 10, and the caves get, the voids get clearer and clearer and clearer as you go along, which suggests that, and we know that some of them were hit during construction and collapsed. And so places in between these lines might be where it was filled in because it had been removed or had been collapsed in on itself. And then we can um, see um, s smaller details like this one right over here, where you're catching the edge of some other large void-like feature or excavation. And I, I see these things as uh, really the amazing tool for the surface we walk on, we walk across the parking lots, and we do not think of everything that's down there. There's old buildings, there's old gas stations, there's uh, beer caves, there's about anything you can imagine in an urban environment. And, oh, sorry. Um, Back to the brewery cave there under uh, um, the Union Brewery there at Brewery Square. Uh, this is a, a panoramic photograph where you're looking at both ends at the tunnel at the same time. And so these were uh, online for a while. And you could kind of, through the photographic method, look at the cave without then turn it around and tip it up and do all these kind of neat three-dimensional um, elements to it. And, and it really makes an outstandingly unusual type of photograph, but it's very telling in, in showing where the debris was and how the arches were constructed and the scale and mass of the whole thing. And it's thinking back to 1855 in the brewery, I mean, most of it was mud, it was horse manure, it was cheap jobs of uh, woodcutters and coopers and the, the brewmasters did very well, but the rest of it, you're kind of just sleeping in the brewery all the time. And it'd be hard to imagine um, that smell. I mean, uh, that smell of beer, which used to permeate a lot of cities in America so commonly now is gone. But um, I still get the, the sense of it when I'm over there. I can see the building and I knew what people were doing. And when I go past those empty lots, I kind of still see the pictures of the buildings in those lots, like ghosts from the past. And every time I drive by, I think, I know where the entrance is to that one. I just need to get the right thing to find it so that uh, we can, I could see what's down there, which is probably not very likely. Um, so. Um, that's pretty much the presentation, and I'm open for questions now. I, I don't think I'm too far off, Marlon. If I say that if you went in this space, it'd be twice as wide as this room, it'd be twice as deep as this room, and it would vault up to about a 15 or 16 foot ceiling. So I don't yes. know if you can tell in those photographs, the scale is enormous, and it's room after room down there. So does they anyone are, have a they question? They are a lot uh, larger than one would expect, uh, certainly. And there's levels of them even through uh, the town right here. And there are other 
uh, right outside the door is a place that hooks in to the 1855 stone box sewer system of all of Old Town through here. It's not that far underground. It's all made out of giant limestone slabs and it runs from nearly up Brown Street to Mercy Hospital from over there to the old academy building across the street and one of them ended here and then it goes down to Old Capitol and then from there they go uh, down to the river. These are not beer caves. The beer caves don't connect to anything else, okay? <laughs> but the old, built at the same time, are these uh, underground uh, sanitation devices, which are kind of high tech in 1855, and they're large. They're four or five feet square, and some of the brick ones are probably six feet high. And uh, the, the town's full of filled in creeks and ravines, and uh, probably no one here probably knows where Beer Creek is. <laughs> well, there used to be a Beer Creek here in Iowa City, and actually it's under a parking lot between the Bluebird and, and Georgia's now. But there's a little grate down there that used to be uh, Beer Creek, and it was where all the brewery effluent ran out, all, you know, and um, it must have been a heck of a messy place. It must have smelled horribly. And the swill, they used to give the swill to the, the pigs and stuff, but uh, eventually I, it usually got so bad that the city's like Iowa City was forced to come in and channel it, you know, through piping and run it into their main um, sewer outlets and stuff down to the river. But uh, I can just imagine the traffic going on where these Teamsters are loading up with all these kegs. These kegs are bigger and some of them are huge and the arguments and the uh, uh, people and the mud and, well, anyway. <laughs> um, uh, any questions? I'm sorry. This was fascinating. Thank you for the presentation. Um, did I hear you say that the Brewmaster's house is still standing? Yeah, there's three Brewmaster's house still standing, and uh, the Englerts have two on Jefferson Street. Um, on Market Street, behind uh, the Union Brewery is the Brewmaster's house, and then um, behind the Great Western Brewery is where uh, Dr. Smolin's office is. That's the old Brewmaster's house, and there's actually a, a root cellar or cave that comes out from the bottom of that one into the parking lot. So <clears throat> was the beer bottled on location or was um, it all moved it by caves? It was not bottled really until bottling became um, practical. It was for local distribution, although the railroad got here in 1855. It was all sold in taverns locally around town, and it was probably shipped out for a short distance. There was no refrigeration. It wasn't pasteurized. You had about a seven-day lifespan on it, so it all had to be consumed. And, and it wasn't until, you know, uh, railroad cars with ice in them that you could really ship it any, any distance. But Iowa had gone through five uh, periods of uh, prohibition starting back in the 1840s and 50s and up through the 17, I mean 1875 and another one in 1884. And so uh, they were constantly working and not working and legal and illegal. Like a lot of the river cities in the state just ignored prohibition altogether. Um, Dubuque and Fort Madison and other places, they just said uh, it doesn't apply to us. Sheriff's not going to enforce it, we're just going to do it anyway. And they did. They tried that here, and that's how the beer riots of 1884 came about. <laughs> but um, it, it wasn't just in Iowa City, it was all across the state. There was other similar incidences um, in Ames and, and uh, Marengo, I think, and some other, some other towns around. So if you wanted beer in your community, you had to have a brewery of some kind? You would, uh, oftentimes, if you wanted just a little beer, you'd bring a pail. And then they would pour you out that much, and then you would take it home. And then uh, eventually, uh, by the 1870s, bottling started to uh, be worth, uh, I mean, they started making bottles brown so you couldn't see the contents, right? And so you didn't get clear bottles until they started making a product good enough that you didn't mind looking at it in the bottle, all right? But the, the trick with anything that's carbonated is the closure. How do you make it? airtight or seal it up. And so there was a number of uh, four or five patents 
Uh, and one, the first one that really worked well was that, that bale stopper, which you see on a lot of European beers, where you have the plug, the ceramic plug, and the bale comes up and locks it down in. And those could stand the pressure and the shaking and stuff. But um, again, they had a very short life lifespan, that uh, seven or eight days or so, and um, they only produced enough generally to last the city, which was about like 5,000 people at that time, more or less, counting the outlying area. So that's who they're serving. But the water was no good, all right? You couldn't drink your well water here. And the water that you could consume was the soft water, the rainwater off the roof, and it would go into a cistern. So everybody drank beer all the time because they didn't want cholera, they didn't want dysentery, all right? They didn't want all those things if you got it out of your well. And um, uh, scarlet fever and, um, and cholera and, and uh, yellow fever came through Iowa City at various times. And um, at, the, at the river, like at, at Muscatine, um, they just wouldn't let people off the boat. It was like a, a quarantine. Then uh, also when people during the prohibitions couldn't get alcohol in Iowa, they get on the train, they would go to Moline load up their suitcases and come back, all right? So it's not like it ever really stopped. You just worked around it. And then in the real prohibition in the 1920s, just north of town, um, bootleggers were uh, out in the woods out where the reservoir is out there. And they, they provided a lot of the hard liquor for town. And, but um, a lot of it was kind of made on farms and they found uh, ways to produce it. You make an important point about the distinction between like local prohibition because Muscatine cleaned up their vice district in about 1910. Uh -huh. If you go to the city directories, the next year they've eliminated about 50 local saloons and yes. a couple of brewers. So it did have a tremendous impact on that community. Had a lot to do with the ethnicity of the community, and, the Irish um, and Dubuque and the Catholics. I would say that beer was very expensive, but if you would go to a, a, a tavern or someplace, you could eat as much as you want as long as you ate beer. So you men mostly, of course, would just stay there all day and they'd eat and they'd drink and drink and eat and eat and eat and that was part of it. You bought the beer, then you could stay. The women had different problems. They couldn't, oh, I'm sorry about this, go out with, you know, and just like um, purchase alcohol. Just wasn't done. They didn't drink in public whatsoever, even up into the 1920s and 30s. But they had things like rose water, all right, and bitters. And, and these perfumes that weren't really perfumes, they were just like vodka with a little bit of rose flavoring on it. And you could put a little there and spill some in your mouth and, uh, you know, <laughs> stay home that night, perhaps, or it'd be a lot calmer. And certainly the patent medicine uh, business from the Hostetter's Bitters and uh, Lydia Pinkham's Female Cures and the Wines of Kaduri and all these exotic name stuff were essentially just alcohol. Now, the government did take offense to the bitters, which were very strong, like 100 or 120 proof. And so um, in the, about 1917 or something like that, they made all, they were gonna outlaw them and, or make them liquor and outlaw them. And so they had a choice, they had to change the recipe. And the only way, what they found out, the, the manufacturers, is they put a whole lot of ginseng in it. And so when you drank a whole bunch of it, you just had to go to the bathroom all the time. So it really cut down on drinking in America because everybody was busy, you know, taking care of their problem. And, you know, it really cut down on alcoholism in America for about three or four years. And then uh, they got the law changed. But, I mean, it, they're always playing games with each other. Things may have been a little looser in the big cities. My grandmother, and we can date this, pretty close to 1905, 1908, because she was born in 1901 and her father died in 1910. Uh, she tells a story, and she was Irish and known to exaggerate, yeah. but she tells the story of going down on a daily basis to get a pail of beer for her father. Uh -huh. uh, so a young child was sold a pail of beer and she got it for a nickel. Yes, if you could reach the counter, you could buy beer, <laughs> okay? And, <laughs> and buying it by the pail, was the most common way to get it. And it was fresh, obviously. It's like grandma's Christmas bread kind of flavor. It's just like perfect. And, and they also would buy it for their livestock. 
you know, they you know when they show cattle at the state fair in the old days, they'd give them a bucket of beer before they went out. You know, if your sow is having trouble delivering the piglets, go get a bucket of beer. Okay, and it worked very, very well. <laughs> so there was a lot of buckets of beer traveling around town with little kids. They'd always send the little kids out to get it. You just inspired me to ask to or make two more comments. Sure. You won't be surprised to know my great grandfather died of liver disease. Not at all. And uh, secondly, uh, during the Super Bowl, when I was watching the ads, I saw the Budweiser ad where the little dog comes back and the horses save him from a wolf. I have three Siberian Huskies, so I was quite incensed to see that the wolf was actually a brown-eyed Siberian Husky who looks a lot like my blue-eyed Siberian Husky. Uh, and uh, of course, the froth around the mouth, I just told people they probably gave it Budweiser. You know? Absolutely. Um, naturally carbonated beer, this beer was not pasteurized. It was a you know, naturally carbonated, that's what the aging cellars were for. Um, commercial beer, and well, we can talk about Budweiser uh, because it's so well known, but they carbonate it just like you do a Pepsi. All right, it, there's nothing particularly natural to it. And I took a tour of the Budweiser factory down in St. Louis, and they have, they told me they had uh, beer caves down there, 20 acres of them. And so, uh, and that uh, other towns, St. Louis and, and Dubuque, and they're riddled with these things. The, people's, the roads cave in, the edges of people's houses go into a sinkhole because you know, it's, it's been undermined. I think this technology can help find those things you know, when people really uh, want to. Would you, say, would you say a little bit about the uh, other periods of prohibition? Uh, were they citywide, countywide, and how were they enacted and repealed? Well, there were towns and counties in Iowa that were dry, and they had set up uh, themselves as dry, but they didn't hardly ever stay dry. And so um, as beer was very local, all right, so if you had a, a county seat, it was often a good place, or there was a tavern down the road where they would be making their own. If you remember the old roadhouse or the steakhouse era back in the 40s to the 60s in America, the tavern was just on the other side of the county line, okay? This county, the sheriff was okay, everybody was okay, whether it was prohibition or not. Now, other cities, like Iowa City, very much took prohibition very seriously every time it came through, all, all five times. And that's what led to all the trouble here. Other cities, it was kind of catch as catch can if the county sheriff or the local people who probably have owned the breweries um, didn't want prohibition, they'd be like, well, if you want it, you come and enforce it. We're not. And, and so it kind of was an up and down curve, but always there. They would say it was prohibition, but nobody actually prohibited anything so often. A popular vote, or did the county council um, I would say in uh, Dubuque, it was a mandate by everybody, all right, that we're going to consume alcohol here, we're going to make alcohol here, we're going to ship alcohol here, all the way. I've gotten calls from Oregon and Canada about Dubuque beer bottles and asking me how did they get out there. And I say, I'll tell you how they got out there, is they built the train to Dubuque and they loaded it and they shipped it all the way out on the railroad line and dropped it off because they had refrigerator cars or ice cars by that time. And, and so Dubuque's beer didn't go east, but it went all the way to the Pacific. Yes, it, it was. And Here's a question here. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm curious, again, uh, I'm, uh, we just moved here not too long ago, and I'm curious about the exact locations. Is it possible to show that map again with street names? And I know where the Bluebird is, I know where uh -huh. the George's is, well, but I'm curious just, about the direction uh, and where it is. A few blocks from here. Let me see if I can pull this back up and find that. All right, well, all right, that's Bloomington Street. You can see um, this is, uh, I believe, Gilbert Street, and, and this is Jefferson Street. This is where John's Grocery is now on the corner, right over there, just, just a few blocks. Uh, Catholic Church here, um, St. Mary's, is uh, visible from right here. I mean, it's just right 
over there a block or two. And, and what is missing in all this is that we're um, the um, Van Allen and buildings from the university, this used to be Church Park. So in, th in this time period, that whole area um, right out there where the hospital is was a park. It was empty. And uh, things have really changed. But uh, that church is still there. Uh, that brewery is still, still there. And the old hotel is still there. So um, it's uh, really a small area over here, just a couple blocks away. I guess just right down the street down here, what, like two blocks, really? Marlon, sure. The parking lot is just across the alley from Hamburg Inn, is that right? Um, it's, um, Pagliais? Yeah, it's Pagliais in, in that area over there. That was part of the Great Western Brewery um, Company. And there were tunnels that connected these yes, various they're still caves down there. that go under the street. Well. Um, Going under the street was not uncommon anywhere downtown, and they still have those loading things that come up out of the sidewalk. A lot of those are still there, and there were, up until probably the 1920s, um, small tunnels with doorways and businesses down underneath there in some small areas. Uh, the city has taken to closing all those off. There used to be one of those risers, and you know where the Deadwood Bar is, but out where that patio is, they paved over where that used to rise up out of the street. You would load it up and take it down below and then distribute it. Any more questions? Let's give Marlon another round of applause. Thank you. Thanks so much. Watching City Channel 4. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.